Yeah, I kind of wanted to do something different from the background since this, everyone says this is a different episode, you know, not a typical Star Trek episode. But what I find interesting about that is, especially after rewatching it for this rumination, I don't think I agree with that. Like, obviously, there's some elements of this that are a little bit unusual, but it feels very much like a Star Trek episode. And I don't know what else to say about that, as ever. I'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts and comments on this. What I find interesting is I've never heard anyone who actively dislikes this episode. Now, I know several people who don't think it's anything special, but I, I've never heard someone say, oh, this episode sucks. Which I find interesting personally since there were two people in particular who were very against the entire idea of this episode. Rick Berman and Gene Roddenberry. So, <clears throat> there was, well, how do I phrase this? There was an entire thing about the idea that this is not a serialized show. They had actually finished the fourth episode, uh, or excuse me, I should say more accurately, this was the fourth episode, uh, which means I suppose they'd already done Brothers and Suddenly Human, as well as, you know, Best of Both Worlds Part 2. And then they were finally like, well, I shouldn't say they, but more like Pillar had been like, this is wrong, guys. We just had Picard going right back to business as if nothing had changed. This is this huge dramatic event and it needs to have some kind of impact. And I believe he had a line here. I'm trying to find the exact line here. Forgive me. Because he talks about this constantly. Ah, here it is. You know, next week Picard can be fine. But for a show that prides itself on its realistic approach to storytelling, how can you have a guy who's basically been raped be fine the next week? There's a story in a man like Picard who's lost control. And delving into the psychological crisis that a man like that has to face. And what does he have to do? So... He finally, and he'd been lobbying for this for weeks at this point in time, finally managed to convince Berman and Roddenberry to go with it. Now, I want to explain this, because both of them were against this for different reasons. Rick Berman was against this because he's an idiot, and also a slime bag, although that's not really relevant yet. In a few episodes, we'll start talking about the slimery of Rick Berman and how much he has caused some issues. But this is basically the beginning of Rick Berman finally being a negative influence for Star Trek. He's done some positive stuff. He has definitely helped get Star Trek going, and he deserves credit for that. But he's also kind of a scumbag, and that needs to be acknowledged as well. Roddenberry was against this because of the Roddenberry box. Now, I've actually exp uh, exposited before about why it is I don't personally care for the Roddenberry box. Um, I suppose the simplest and easiest way to explain that would be that I think it is taken to an extreme. Ironically, several of my viewers actually agreed with me in, in principle on this concept as well. Uh, the idea that it is, it's a decent enough idea that's just taken way too far out of bounds. So the idea here was Roddenberry insisted that no human would have to recover from being assimilated by the Borg because of the Roddenberry box. Yeah, I, I feel like that makes my point for me. I really do. One moment, please. Anyways, <clears throat> sorry, had to deal with that. I've been trying to record for a while now, and there's been interruptions and construction going on nearby, and it's just been a huge hassle. So it's actually the third time I've sat down to record this, so please forgive me. Anyways, Pet Berman was against this because this isn't a serialized show. Berman was actually extremely anti-continuity. It was, it was kind of weird, actually. I get that continuity isn't for everyone. I get not everyone is as for it as I am. But I don't understand being so anti-continuity to the point where he was against the very idea of showing any consequences of actions. This is actually funny since if there was one word that would describe season four best, in my opinion, it would be the word continuity. This is when uh, Brennan Braga started working on the show, I already mentioned that, as well as Ronald D. Moore came on and became a, you know, a major element in the writing staff. And uh, in both cases, both of them were pushing for the same thing, more continuity. This very episode has three things right off the top of my head. The prune juice thing, the ho excuse me, four things. The prune juice thing, the holodeck thing, the hair thing, and the bottle of 47. All four of those elements either go back or forward in, in continuity. Like I said, it's that setting continuity, which TNG is actually quite good at. So, that's cool. But Berman was like, no, screw it. Okay, fine, fine, fine. I'll allow it, but you have to have some sci-fi element. So they had this idea with, like, children disappearing, and then they had this thing about a black hole, and they just wandered around in circles, and nothing was working. And Pillar was willing to make this work because he really wanted this Picard story. But finally, and I'm going to pull a direct quote here, he decided 
This is Pillar speaking of Berman. He decided we're not going to ruin the episode with Picard by trying to put in some ridiculous scientific thing, and we decided to do it the way it was originally conceived, and it was a whole show about family. Now, that's good because, in my opinion, the Picard stuff is good, but the Worf stuff is excellent. As weird as that may sound, I actually find the Worf stuff to be better than the Picard stuff. I know that sounds incredulous, but I'll try to explain my points as we go through. And the Wesley stuff was nice, too. Although... Well, we'll talk more about the Wesley thing when we get to uh, Final Mission, which is not too long from now. Anyways, I also want to mention one thing really quick. This is a direct quote from Rick Berman about Season 4. And I quote, We did not really set a fourth season goal. We knew which characters we wanted to focus on and what kind of stories we wanted to do in very broad strokes. We knew Wesley was going to be leaving, of course. We knew we had to start off a show that finished up the Borg experience. But our ultimate goal was to do good episodes as opposed to working on a seasonal arc of some sort. I think that right there really says everything that needs to be said about Rick Berman's attitude when it comes to this. But I digress. I don't want to bash the man too much. I have plenty of time to do that elsewise. So, having just, just fought and struggled to get this continuity thing in, uh, we we get some nice little moments. Um, there's there's three major people who are really pushing this episode forward, and I think they're the reasons this episode was so good. Pillar, who ended up doing some of the the, the story ideas and concepts, Ronald E. Moore, who wrote it, and Les Landau, who directed it, and all three of them were like, Grr! and we get family as a consequence. I want to talk about the West stuff first because it's the least there's the least to say about it. I actually, um, when my, when members of my family who are, who are very young, uh, were born, I actually sat down and recorded a video to, to be played for them when they are much, much older, because I can do that. That's the era of technology I live in. But also because it occurred to me that it's the kind of thing that I, you can only do once. It, it's not like when I am, you know, 20 years from now, I could sit down and say, okay, so this is what I thought 20 years ago. Being able to do that now is just sort of a unique opportunity and something that I feel is, should be done more than it actually is. So the very concept of Jack Crusher actually jotting down his notes and thoughts about Wesley is actually really cool, and I'm on board with the idea. I also like the idea of bringing Jack Crusher on screen. He's actually been referenced many times, going back as far as season one of TNG. And plenty of Star Trek fans have been asking at conventions and in some of the uh, letter campaigns that existed at the time, as well as interviews and magazines, what's going on with Jack Crusher. So the idea to bring him in was kind of a logical one. The sad thing is the Jack Crusher plot was originally supposed to be a little bit longer to involve more of the legacy of the Crusher name and how many different points in history the Crushers were involved in, that kind of a thing. That was all cut for time because it was the weakest link of the three, and it is, but it's a bit of a shame. I kind of wish we could get like a director's cut version of that, but obviously it's not even possible, especially nowadays. You know, this would have been possible back in like 92, not 2018, you know, or 19, excuse me, whatever year it is right now. So that's actually all I have to say about the Wesley stuff. I know. Let's talk about the Picards thing. He mentions that the nightmares have ended. I don't believe that for a second. I really don't. Ignoring the fact that he actually has nightmares as far forward as first contact, we see how this incident continues to color and affect his life going forward. This comes up in the drumhead which is later in this season. This comes up in Emissary over in DS9. I, I feel like there's other examples like I Borg and whatnot, but th- this incident continues to have impact on Picard's life. This is a major life-changing event that he never really gets over, which is in fact kind of the point, actually. Probably one of the reasons Roddenberry didn't like it, if I'm being completely blunt about it. So then, <laughs> there's this great bit. Apparently they wanted to give Picard the keys to the city. They wanted to give him a parade. And you know what's really interesting about that? That makes sense. He's a, he's a hero. He is a technically a galaxy-saving hero at this point, but at the very least he is a Federation-saving hero. And he somehow managed to redeem, you know, and save the day and stop the Borg. And this isn't just some thing. It's not like he just won a battle. He just basically saved the world and the entire Federation. And everyone knows it, to some extent or another. Robert even flat out says, you know, I I don't know specifics. Nobody knows specifics, I'm sure, down below. But everyone knows that there was a severe, horrific level threat. I always like to think, 
I know this sounds strange, but I always like the idea of of like the side stories going on during major stories. Picture a, a short story or a short like a video short, a television short being done on Earth during Best of Both Worlds. The panic, the evacuations that are being attempted, the frantic attempt to scramble ships together, the frantic attempt to try and get everything. You know, how about at the last minute they just they, ha- they you know there's people who have to decide: do we send ships to transport people off Earth, or do we send ships to the front lines? And of course, given what happened at O three five nine, the idea that the ships that were supposed to help evacuate Earth were actually sent out to O three five nine, and then that happened, right? I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot of story potential there. And then we did it. We win. Of course they want to give him a parade. I bet every city on the planet wants to give him a parade right now. Him and Riker both. But Picard doesn't want any of that. Why would he? He lost. I've actually already discussed this in depth and in detail in the episode First Contact because that's really where this entire story arc really concludes. The story arc that basically started with this episode. Picard lost. The Borg beat him. No matter what he did, no matter what he tried, he lost. And that's... It's kind of unique in Picard's history and his career, but also really indicative of the kind of character he is. This is someone who has given everything to his career and trying to be the best he can. Even Robert says that you were always the one who won the ribbons and who who won the parades and who stood up there on the pedestal having, having accomplished the best and succeeded at the marathon. You were the one who beat everyone at everything except the Borg. He couldn't beat the Borg. He didn't beat the Borg. Let's just be 100% honest about that. The Borg beat him. So, there's moments where, Patrick, there's moments I actually never noticed before until I was doing this rumination. Patrick Stewart manages, and and I think Les Landau has at least some of this as well. Patrick Stewart has moments where he, you can tell he's lost in the Borg. Like, there's this wonderful scene where he's looking around and and he's just taking in all of the area. And you can just tell he's picturing it as if it was green. By which I mean assimilated. Trying to envision his home village, his home villa, being taken by the Borg. And how close he came to that. How close it, it, it almost was that he did that. Right? Very powerful moment. And then he kind of drags himself away. And each time he kind of drags himself back away from it. This whole thing with the Atlantis Project and Lewis and being like, yeah, I want to make this dude. It's funny. Robert is actually more polite than I remembered. I mean, he still obviously bickers, but he's actually not as outright rude or cantankerous as memory told me. Now, by contrast, however, Lewis and Marie, actually, are both just incredibly affable, warm, loving, kind, etc. They just embrace Picard. And you kind of get the idea, Picard finds himself legitimately considering leaving Starfleet and dealing with this Atlantis project. And Lewis is, of course, pushing for it. And he tries to open to Marie about it. And this is, every now and again, God, I love Patrick Stewart's acting. Every now and again, he loses all his masks. There's no smile when he's when he loses his masks here. There's just this expression of quiet guilt and horror. It's one of the better presentations of this kind of PTSD, because let's call it what it is, that I've seen presented in Star Trek in general. He portrays someone who is lost in an abyss of his own thought. The whole time... Robert actually has kind of been dancing around Picard, prodding him, poking him, you know. And then what's interesting, though, is I mentioned he's more polite than I remembered. He pulls back almost constantly, like, oh, you did this. He doesn't push too hard until finally he comes into the room and sees Picard sitting there getting drunk. And he's like, all right, it's time. And then he starts to really prod him. You want the heroes? Welcome. You 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 don't want to cancel the parade? You want to come home, victorious, maybe off into the sea, get lost in the sea. And he just pushes him and pushes him. And then some of the legitimate bitterness comes out, and we start to see that Robert has actually resented Picard probably for most of his life. There's a really subtle line earlier that I I actually missed until this replay, where Picard says, Ah, Perhaps it's time to change all that. This is when he's talking to René, well before Robert has even entered the show. And he just says that quietly to himself. Perhaps it's time to change all that. It's a nice touch. It gets a lot of good exposition in there, just quick and dirty like that. 
And there's, of course, this constant under undercurrent of pro-tech versus pro-tradition, which I'm not even going to cover because it's, it's very obvious and there's nothing really to say about it. But then they finally fight. Picard just slugs him full tilt. Once upon a time, I went through something kind of bad. Only kind of. It was very stressful. It was extremely stressful. And I was very wound up and very tight, taut, and I was having trouble. And my sister provoked me, actually got me upset, and... and poked me until I finally had a brief outburst. Now, I didn't do anything. In fact, actually, the only thing I did was I stood up angrily. In the process, I ended up jostling my niece, who was actually in my lap at the time. This is several years ago. And what that did was that shook me out of it. And she did that on purpose, as she admitted almost immediately after. Like, okay, I didn't actually mean it. I was just trying to get you to burst there so you could recover, because she felt that I needed to just vent for a second to finally be able to catch myself and be myself. And that's basically what Robert has been doing to Picard here. Pushing and pushing and pushing, never pushing too hard, until finally he felt it was time to really go all out and burst that bubble and make Picard snap. Because Picard slugs him, and you could tell there's a lot of anger in that slug. But not really at Robert. When they start wrestling in the mud, it's clear very quickly that this is just two brothers just having fun, and it dissolves into laughter very quickly. And they just kind of cheerfully throw mud at each other. And then Patrick Stewart, Patrick Stewart's it up and portrays someone who just dissolves into a sobbing, utter, horribly honest mess as the dam finally bursts and he admits just how horrible he really feels about all of this. The whole speech is here. I actually have it right here. I thought about reading it to you. You know, you don't know, you don't know. They took everything I was. They used me to kill and destroy, and I couldn't stop them. And, he, and I'm not going to read you the whole thing. It's, it's a brilliant speech, and I'm sure you know the scene. But I mention it because all of it could be summarized by two words. I failed. That's why he hates the idea of the parade. That's why he doesn't want keys to the city. That's why he doesn't want people to celebrate him as a hero. Because he's not! Or at least, he doesn't think he is. He believes that he is the one who didn't do well enough. All those people on Earth who are cheering his name, and all he can see is the officers at Wolf 359. Kudos. Tons of kudos for Pillar, Moore, and uh, Liz Landau for really pushing this episode into production. I legitimately feel like Star Trek as an aggregate would be lesser if not for the inclusion of this episode and all of this power that's coming from Picard and his scenes. Robert says something shortly thereafter that, and it's a wonderful thing because it's brilliantly honest. It's not, you will get better. It's not, you'll get over this. It's not, it's okay. Instead, what Robert says is, this will be with you forever. So you have to decide where you take it with you. If you're going to take it to Atlantis, or are you going to take it back into the Enterprise? And that's the point, because this whole Atlantis thing isn't actually tempting to Picard. I mean, it's, it's curious and kind of a distant sort of a thing, but not in a I-want-to-dedicate-my-life-to-it kind of a way. But Picard has been seeking it as a form of escape, to get away from everything that he fears and hates. But as Robert points out, it will not be an escape. He will not get away. It will still be with him. So you should go back where you belong. And that is kind of awesome. And then he gives him the 47, which actually shows up in future episodes, including uh, First Contact, not the movie, the episode. It's good stuff. Like I said, continuity. Let's talk about Worf. First of all, Ronald D. Moore is actually the reason that we have uh, Miles O'Brien as an enlisted man, and the very concept of an enlisted man actually exists in Star Trek. He said he wanted to introduce that wrinkle to the military structure of Starfleet, which I like, and he also said he wanted to add more characterization to Miles and to uh, Sergei. Sergei. God, I, I screw it up. Worf's father. Worf's parents are kind of awesome, and one of the best parts is right at the beginning, Worf is obviously very hesitant about them coming on board, and Riker and, War Riker and Worf talk about it. And what's funny is they cut to the heart of the matter almost immediately. Again, continuity, they mention the discommendation. Now, we have made it very clear that this bothers Worf a lot. And this episode really starts to hammer in the point of how much this commendation bothers him. This will also be a continuing trend in the future, especially in Season 4, because continuity. O'Brien also 
uh, has a really good scene with Worf where he just relates to him. And there's some good chemistry between the two. That'll show up again over in Deep Space Nine, which is kind of neat as well. Uh, I believe by this point has shown up. Again, I don't know what my DS9 schedule is yet. I'm not there yet. So what's interesting to me is that the two parents, uh, the Rozenkos, are portrayed as typical, almost cliched, and yet, at every opportunity, the actors and the, the script both go out of the way to show that they aren't. Oh, yes, uh, he's my son, and I dote over him, and okay, here, let's get serious for a second. And the father's like, ha ha, I'm going to embarrass him. Can I stay with the engineer? Okay, yeah, okay, listen, I want to talk to you about my son. You know, th it's, it's a great thing. It adds wonderful humanization to the whole thing. See, the see I have less to say about the wharf scenes and, and his family, but to me, they were more emotionally impacting and in a very, well, tear-jerky kind of a way. A good way, a good way. It is very obvious from the way they present themselves that they really, really care about Worf. That this, these, this, think about this for a second. Please picture this. Like 30-ish years ago to now, however old Worf is. I don't know off the top of my head. Please forgive me. So in an era in which they're not super cool with the Klingons yet, and, you know, they're, they're still having troubles and, you know, there's never been a Klingon raised on Earth and there's no Klingon in Starfleet, you know, all that fun stuff. And this human couple decides to take in a Klingon child and raise him as their own. And they did it. Starting that is difficult enough. Concluding it? That's insane. And yet they managed it. These two people loved him. There's so many moments... When the father takes a side, you know, oh, yes, I was a warp field specialist on the old Excelsior class, you know. And Geordi, of course, he's all for that. And he takes him aside, and Geordi is like, hey, yeah, so... And he starts gushing about the warp fields, and then the father says, oh, that's fascinating, that's fascinating. I want to talk about my son. And, first of all, I love how naturally and sincerely he says those words. There's no doubt whatsoever that he legitimately 100% perceives Worf as his son and everything that it, that implies and all of the impact that that should have. And that's awesome. And second of all, Geordi, who is not exactly stupid and knows Worf and, and the whole situation very well, immediately gets that this is something important and just kind of nods. He's, you know, I'm ready for whatever it is. And we don't even see what he's talking about, but we kind of learn over time why these two had insisted on seeing Worf, because this is the first time they've seen him since the discommendation. And it is all about that. They heard about it. Worf informed them. And the kid from... Um, oh, what's the name of that stupid episode? Uh, the Bonding should technically be there, too, but let's just, let's just ignore that for a moment. We can only do so much continuity, I guess. Anyways. There's so many human moments. They... There's this bit where the family, where the mother and father, are, you know, Worf says, you know, hey, you know, and I need to go to the bridge. Please let me, please let Guyna know if you need it. And they're like, oh, of course, of course. And then they almost just, you can see them just kind of drop the masks for a second as they're just like, what do we do? We have to, maybe we should just let go of it. No, we can't let go. He's my son. I can't. This is so important. Blah, blah, blah. And Guinan comes over and is Guinan. Let's just be honest. Guinan is one of the most singularly awesome characters in all of Star Trek. So I, I think we could turn Guinan into a verb at this point. So Guinan, Guinan's over there and lets them know about Worf, lets them know about prune juice. It's another continuity thing there. Uh, there's another bit earlier where he mentions, do you still do the holodeck program with the big monsters, which was in two previous episodes? And he even mentions, she even mentions, your hair's gotten longer. If you remember, his hair was shorter back in season one. All little tids, tidbits. I love it. I love it. But then she says, you know, your son, and they, they just kind of cheer stories about him for a second. You know, the blood pie, which apparently Worf really likes. He actually even asks for another serving of it because he enjoyed it that much. That says something right there. But Guinan mentions that everyone looks out of this window looking for that one star called home. And Worf isn't looking towards Kronos when he looks out there. He's looking towards Earth, and he's looking towards them. And you know what? I firmly believe that all the way up until and through the end of Deep Space Nine. Unfortunately, the Rizhenkos don't really get a lot of presence in the rest of the entire series. But I like to think that Worf always really believes that his family is those two. And that his home is where they are. And then the, the episode really kind of nails it home. Because 
they come into his room and he's like, oh, yes, yes, please. I thought you were going to bed. And they're like, yeah, well. And then what I love most is Worf is so very Worf with them. He is open and honest. I did not want you to come aboard, but I am happy that you are here. And then they both say, son, you know, this whole discommendation thing. And he's like, no, I must suffer it alone. And they say, no. Remember, one of the biggest things about Klingon culture is that Klingon, what they say doesn't necessarily matter so much as how they, people react to them. It's all about those reactions, testing people. And Worf does this in a lot of his reactions with others. So he pushes them away hard. No, I must serve this alone. And they push back just as firmly. No, we're with you. We are proud of you. We love you. We are your family. You are our son. And it's not stated outright, but the implication is that they are effectively taking on part of that burden. And we know this matters to Worf. We know this is a weight around his neck. And it will continue to be for many episodes in the future. And the idea that they want to help shoulder that, you can tell how much that means to him. And Michael Dorn, who has ever really knows how to use his, his face, just kind of shows that in a simple smile. And a bark. <laughs> this is a great episode. This is a really great episode. I really enjoyed it. I'm really glad we got it. I hope you guys have enjoyed. I'll see you next time.